White Noise is the latest thought-provoking film to hit Netflix, offering audiences a deep dive into the intricate layers of human existence. Today, we're delving into the captivating narrative of this enigmatic movie and the compelling insights it offers on the complexities of life and morality. Be warned, there are spoilers ahead, so if you haven't had the chance to watch the film yet, you might want to hold off on this discussion until you've experienced it firsthand. So, let's embark on this journey of unravelling the mysteries and complexities of White Noise. Early in the film, Jack and Babette have a conversation about their fear of death, with neither wanting to be left alone and instead wanting to be the first one of the two to die. This is also emphasised by the children being captivated by death on television, as well as the airborne toxic event that happens in the middle of the film. The fear of death is so prominent in the movie that Babette is crippled by it, compromising her marriage and leaving her seemingly on the verge of suicide. Babette's fear of death led to a newspaper ad for a new experimental drug that would potentially cure this fear. However, the trial was shut down before Babette got any of the medication. She was so engulfed by her fears that it led to her having an affair with Willie Mink, who she refers to as Mr. Grey to hide his identity from Jack. In exchange for regular sexual favours, Mink would provide Babette with access to the Dilla drug. This is a nod to Americans of the 1980s, consistent fear of death and their over-reliance on medication to solve problems. Much of this is still present in modern society. Dilla doesn't work for Babette, but she still experiences side effects, such as the inability to distinguish words from things. As an example, if someone yelled, speeding bullet, Babette would duck and cover to avoid what she assumed would be an incoming speeding bullet. Jack's fear of death increases when he is accidentally exposed to the airborne toxic event. Jack believes that he will now die first, which compounds his fear of death and causes him to seek out the Dilart medication in hopes it will work to quell his fears. This is despite the fact that he is showing no signs at all of any negative effects of the airborne toxic event. In fact, the diagnosis comes from Simuvac, a company that simulates evacuations, replacing real fears with simulated or fabricated fears. Another nod to the 1980s, but also a clear directive that Jack isn't actually dying any faster than someone with a healthy diagnosis. At the same time, Jack's rage and pride as a man propel him to want to kill Mink because of the affair with his wife. This also harkens back to a conversation Jack had with his colleague Murray about how killing someone could potentially alleviate the fear of death. But initially, this was to help Jack protect his family when they were sheltering and avoiding the airborne toxic event. Murray gave Jack a small pistol in case things got out of hand, but Jack didn't feel as though he could use it on anyone. Marie's words, coupled with Jack's fear of death and his anger towards Mink, allowed him to meet up with Mink at a hotel and shoot him twice with the gun Murray gave him. Luckily, Mink doesn't die, but when Jack places his gun in Mink's hand to make it look like a suicide, Babette bursts into the motel room and they both end up being shot by Mink, although with non-fatal wounds. This leads Jack to realise the meaning of life and how important it is, or rather how needless death is, thus allowing him to inadvertently overcome his death. As they go to an emergency medical centre run by a German atheist nuns who don't believe in an afterlife, the self-reflection Jack has upon envisioning a world where nothing happens after you die also helps to remove his fear of death. And of course, you have the dueling lectures of Jack and Murray in an effort to bring more attention to Elvis' studies. Consumerism is also a big theme in the movie, with a focus on TV, newspaper ads and the supermarket. This is even more pronounced by the safe haven the supermarket represents, as well as the very end when the boxes in the supermarket all become white and generic. This implies that your choice of product doesn't matter, as it's all essentially the same, just with different marketing. Finally, the way the children are portrayed in the movie is also unique, but oddly relatable even in current times. It's also another way to poke fun at academics. In the movie, the children are generally smarter and more competent than the adults. On multiple occasions, the younger children ask their parents for advice, while the parents redirect to Heinrich, the oldest son. Heinrich seems to have vast knowledge, while his father is left teaching Hitler studies and trying to learn German from an equally inept teacher. In the 80s, children had more access to mass media than any previous generation. They had more resources and were able to learn faster and more reliably. The same can be said for modern culture, with the advent of cell phones, Google, YouTube and the internet as a whole. Children can learn about anything in a matter of minutes, all from the palm of their hand. This movie was split into three sections that each related to what we saw unfolding on our screens and represented the main thing that was at play. For example, the first section was called Waves and Radiation. The second was called The Airborne Toxic Event, which saw us focus on the crash and the toxic cloud in the sky that was causing the town to evacuate. And the third section was called Diorama, which in short was Dyla, the mystery pill that Babette was taking, that us along with Jack wanted to find out what it was. As we embarked on the final section of the movie, we saw that fear of death was something that was prominent throughout the entirety of it, but it really reached its peak in the final third. 
We had Babette, who was on Dyla, a placebo-type medication where it was supposed to help with the intrusive thoughts and the fear of dying. We had Jack, who was being told that he had around 30 years left to live, but the clock had already started ticking and speeding up, which then started to drive him to the point where he wanted to lose the fear of death and get on Dyla. And we had many others around them not caring at all, such as the doctors who were almost laughing it off. And Murray, who was oblivious to much of what was going on around him. When they were at Camp Daffodil, the anxieties of life, death and tragic events were each handled differently by all the different characters and it was a true representation of what society is like. People have different fears and different levels of them and we had a window to look inside a postmodern family where all of them had their quirks, even down to the point in the extremity of where we saw Jack go and meet Mr. Grey. Babette knew that there would be there because as she said, you're a guy, I knew you'd be jealous, which he was. He couldn't take the feeling of Babette being with Mr. Grey outside of his head, which is why he felt it was necessary to become the maker and decide who lived and died, with both Babette, Jack and Mr. Grey all being harmed due to the confrontation. The movie ends with a dance number in a local supermarket. The supermarket has become a safe haven throughout the movie. Murray describes the supermarket as essentially a spiritual place, one where people can comfortably wait to die but live happily while they wait, surrounded by consumerism. The movie ending in a supermarket is a subtle nod towards Jack and Babette overcoming their fears while also awaiting their inevitable deaths and to the safe confines of consumerism. While death noises in white noise is a morbid affair, academics become the satire of the film. Many of the classes at college on the hill are more trivial in nature than educational, such as Elvis and Hitler studies, as well as Murray's class on cinematic car crashes with an entire monologue just on that. This is an example of pseudo-professionalism, where the professors lay claim to specialised fields of study that don't actually teach anything. And there you have it, the intricate layers and profound reflections that white noise offers on the complexities of life, death and the human experience. As they've journeyed through the film's exploration of existential anxieties, societal critiques and the nuances of human relationships, we've been invited to confront our own fears and anxieties, encouraging us to cherish the fleeting moments of joy and connection that define our existence. If you enjoyed this breakdown of white noise, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel for more insightful analysis of thought-provoking films. Share this video with someone who loves delving into the depths of cinematic exploration and let us know your thoughts on the movie in the comments below. Until next time, bye!